Hi, Alexandra. How are you? Sorry, I didn't see you there because I was um, I was putting up the the um, topics. Um, I don't know if you can hear me or if you um can unmute. Um, the unmute button is all the way on the bottom right hand. There should be a little microphone symbol, and if you press on that, uh, we can hear you. If it doesn't work the first time, just um, come in and out of the room and then it should work. And welcome everyone. Uh, our guest speaker here, Dr. Alexandra Serafin. It's the first time she's coming to Clubhouse to present us her really interesting and groundbreaking research. So um, Let me text Alexandra if she can hear me, and if not, mm. so change. Okay, we'll figure it out. We'll have we still have a few minutes. In the meantime, I will put up the slides. And this will be a really interesting talk. I'm really looking forward to to it. There are the slides and oh perfect. Hi. So to unmute, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hi, Katarina, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'll, um, I really appreciate it. And I will put up the, um, the paper in the chat. I don't know if you, um, I forgot if it's behind the paywall or not. Um, um, the paper. I'm not sure. I think it's supposed to be open access from what I can okay, remember. Good. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah I, I, right now I just look at But usually when I don't add also like um, find, like in my notes, find bio archive version mm -hmm. or something, then usually <laughs> it's open. So that's what I wanted to make sure. Yeah, and the slides are up. So if you want to check, um, okay. but they should be working and we will start soon. So, and happy Friday, yeah, happy Friday. <laughs> for, you, <laughs> for you, it's already almost time to enjoy your weekend or are you yes. usually, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I mean, but just to let you know that I'm not trying, you know, trying to be unfriendly. I just there are things you can only do once you start. So right now I'm sharing it with people that we are mm -hmm. starting. And then I'll share it really quick on Twitter that we are about to start. Because, you know, people are really around the world. So with the time mm -hmm. difference, it's kind of confusing. So I tell okay. people, okay, it's now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I think I still think it's confusing. I still have to look it up. Uh, it could not especially the times that have a big difference, but mm -hmm. here in the US in different cities, I forget if it's one hour, two, three. Yeah. Know. 
Definitely. Even sometimes between Europe, it's kind of hard to remember which country is in what time zone. So Ireland is the same time zone as Portugal, my yes. home country. So, But then the <laughs> islands, where my aunt is on the islands, there's only four hours, I think. And then anyways. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just in regards to the slides, will people be able to view them as we go? Or is there like um, a share button I can have to, to share what I'm talking about on the screen? Or Yeah, there's no screen share. So it's really helpful okay. if you tell people, OK, I'm switching now to the next slide or maybe okay. even the Perfect. slide number. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that way. And, and people are used to it like this. But yeah, there's no... A screen share on this okay, so perfect. it's just I know yeah. some of my slides have like um overlinked things so it might just be harder for them to see the way that it is on Google Drive so maybe if they can download it it might be easier for them to kind of okay. know what I'm talking about <laughs> okay so <laughs> I'll announce that um okay. right before you start and then I don't know um if I told you before but Usually, so I will in a couple of minutes introduce you, mm -hmm. and then um, the rest of the introduction, like really briefly, and then the rest we usually do kind of in the interview question type of setting, if if that's okay with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because I feel like it's more interesting and personal than um, than me just you know. Mm -hmm saying all the lists of things and then people will just forget about it so. yeah, yeah. Perfect. okay I'll and try it's, my more best. In, it's more informal so mm. yeah um yeah so um yeah whatever the answer is is good there's no, no. <laughs> i won't be graded on this anyway <laughs> exactly. relax we are all you know just happy that you came to take mm. And you took time, so you already won. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, it's always so nice to be able to talk about your research with others. So, yes, of course, right. I jumped on the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad um, to hear. Yeah, it's, uh, most people, many people say yes now. Like some people are nervous um, to talk in English or so. Mm -hmm. um or they say I never practiced this but I especially like younger um like that are doing their PhD or so but I say mm -hmm. you know it's a perfect way to practice because you know no, exactly. nobody will care <laughs> like yeah. nobody that counts will care <laughs> yeah <laughs> how you do here you know like for your career it doesn't <laughs> exactly yeah so um yeah i think we can start and then people will uh, continue coming in other people will listen to the recording and um so um yeah let me start with introductions so welcome everyone to um to our club science society and of course a special welcome to you alexandra thank you to um that you took the time to come here and make the account and everything and um let me give the audience like a little bit of um um you know information about you so they know you a little bit so mm -hmm. alexandra uh, zerafin is a postdoctoral researcher and a fulbright scholar um and um i really really like the the short introduction you had on on linkedin um mm -hmm. that um you you easily um adapt uh, to different environments it's kind of interesting to me and i will ask mm -hmm. about it in the interview and okay. um and um yeah she um um she did her PhD. Um, let me scroll all the way down. I'm so sorry. So um, 
she was a visiting PhD student, uh, a Fulbright scholar um, at the UC San Diego um, from um, April uh, 2021 till January 2022 in California. And um, she, th this award of um, Fulbright Research a scholarship uh, was part of her PhD program and um, she um, how, how did you get the the Fulbright scholar was it really easy was it really like part of your program or was it something you know you had to apply for so Just that's um yeah, yeah so uh, first of all I just want to say thank you for for having me on to your to your clubhouse and for allowing me to sh kind of share my science and research with with everyone here um in terms of the fulbright um i wouldn't say that it was easy to get <laughs> for sure <laughs> yeah, um, yeah yeah it was quite a like a long process as well like you know you have to write your study objectives your research objectives your personal goals and aims and your pro personal profile and you submit that and it's reviewed by a committee um and then after you get selected to the second round you have to go um, for in-person interviews and then um, the Fulbright committee then kind of decides who gets the Fulbright um, scholarship for that particular year. And I was lucky enough um, to be able to, to get it. Um, so I'm very thankful for Fulbright for, for selecting me and allowing me to have this research exchange um, to the University of California, San Diego, to their neuroscience department, where I worked with um, Professor Mark Tushinsky and Professor um, Kobe Koffler um, for this project. So all of their team there was so welcoming and um, it just allowed me to kind of broaden my range um, of my knowledge because I'm mostly based in biomedical engineering. So my, my engineering background is my main forte. Um, so diving into more like the in vitro and in vivo models was something that I really wanted to explore. And um, thankfully due to the research um, at UCSD, I was able to explore that side a little bit more. Yeah, and so you did before that your um, bachelor's with honors at the University of Limerick. Was it something the university supported you with to apply for this um, scholarship? Um, it, in terms of actual supports, um, like we did have uh, the Fulbright committee, like members of the, not the committee, but the the organization uh, in Ireland they do go to several universities in Ireland just kind of spreading awareness that this such a program exists um, and that such an opportunity um, exists so we basically just had more of, a, of an introduction like this is what the program is and if you would like to apply for it you can so there wasn't that many um, supports per se we did have an ambassador so an ex-Fulbrighter um, residing within the university um professor jean mccarthy was the was uh, the fulbright ambassador when i was applying and um just having a few meetings over tea with her kind of allowed me to solidify what exactly this proposal should look like because at the end of the day it is it is a research proposal um and then apart from that there hasn't been that many supports because this is more external to the university so um it's just kind of going through it on your own and again my my supervisor and my mentor professor Morris collins was um involved with that as well and we also had um, involvement from um the fulbright hosts at ucsd to kind of tailor what the proposed project um is will be and so that it will be aligned to both of our of our backgrounds and abilities yeah that's interesting that makes it even more impressive you know that it's kind of an independent thing and that you mm. went through it um you know not completely by yourself but independently i think um yes, yes that's exactly. uh, that's that's really impressive and um usually our question is around when when you realize that you want to uh, become a researcher you know, was it something that you always wanted to do when you were a child, maybe already, or was it something that came later and then kind of sparked your interest? Because you, you seem, yeah. 
to be very driven right <laughs> so, yeah. well, thank you <laughs> i'm glad that's how it's presented <laughs> Um, I think, well, I, I was always very uh, driven by academics. I've always tried to excel in whatever area um, that I could. Um, I chose kind of biome- biomedical engineering because my father was an electrical engineer and my mom has um, her own medical practice. So a lot of the times I would see how my father's uh, background, for example, influence um the machines that are used in the biomedical setting. So I think like that amalgamation of those two practices kind of led me to uh, to work in biomedical engineering. But in terms of actually wanting to do research, when I applied for my undergraduate degree, I will lie and say that, that no, I to tell the truth, I, I didn't really think about research in that area. It's, I wasn't really aware of anything like that and I didn't think it was possible. Um, for, for me. Um, so I was kind of more focused on um, like industry uh, applications after my undergraduate. But funnily enough, um, in UL, we have in our third year of our undergraduate module, we have an eight month cooperative placement where we go into industry and actually work as real engineers in industry. And as part of that, we have visitors from UL come in that will kind of assess um, talk to us and talk to our managers at the time and kind of assess if we're if we're dealing okay so it is like a graded part of our curriculum and um, I think I just briefly mentioned that like maybe my mom wants me to be a professor one day during that interview and the the professor that was interviewing me, me uh, at the time then when I came back to the university for the start of my fourth year so my final year my third year in my uh, in my undergraduate degree um, contacted me and said, hey, we actually have this opportunity um, that you can do research over the summer um, and just see if, if you like it, if you get a taste for it. Um, so that was that kind of piqued my interest because I didn't I didn't know that anything like that was possible or even going on at the university. So I was very much just focused on studying and, and passing tests and everything like that. So when I heard about that, I was like, this is very interesting. And you know what? I already know what industry looks like. Why not try research and see if I like it? You know, so it's kind of being open to opportunities that are presented to you. And then once I was in that research environment and I got to spend all of my time, you know, from nine to six every day, working with research, figuring out ways that you can I don't know, even my Giver technologies or even experiments in in your lab, I found that really interesting. And and that was kind of like, like a passion moment, almost like this, like spark just flamed up inside of me. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And then ever then, since then, I've been trying to pursue that. (laughs) So uh, finishing my undergraduate degree, then going on to doing the the PhD and now in, in my postdoctoral work. So I think that's kind of how it all started, even though, sorry, apologies that it's a really long story. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. It's a wonderful story. It's very encouraging. Um, that's why <laughs> it's also very selfish to ask this question because usually, you know, it's kind of a glimpse of hope um, that there are really nice stories out there, you know, where people support, um, you know, young scientists, like, Definitely. It happened in yeah. your case, like young students and, you yeah. know, people yeah. care. And so it's very, it's a very beautiful story. So thank you for sharing that. It's it's yeah. really yeah. beautiful. And um, yeah, so um, you kind of alluded already how you then came to choose kind of also this field, um, which is a really interesting one. And that I think it will help so many people what you are researching on so um that you you wrote in that you you kind of adapt very well to Mm -hmm. different (laughs) situations that's interesting i kind of felt that um me and also my kids adapt relatively well too but it was because we moved um relatively often you know, around. So we kind of <laughs> learned yeah. that since childhood. Well, how did you get the skill? Because it's a very important one, I mm-hmm. feel like, especially as a scientist, you have to kind of mm-hmm. move more than other people, I think, in your life. So yeah, yeah that, that sparked my interest <laughs> because there's a similarity there. 
Yeah, um, I think quite similar to your your background. Um, I'm originally from Poland, um, so I was born and raised there. But when I was about nine years of age, my family moved to Ireland. So this is kind of where we reside now full time. But um, that even that initial movement, you know, from one culture to another, or even learning English, trying to speak properly <laughs> with other people so that you can integrate into the community, I think, even from a very young age, kind of teaches you like that resilience um, and kind of like the ability to kind of mesh into different communities and societies. Um, so I think that was the first area that I got a taste for, of it but again you can apply it to to so many different environments for example the college environment to the industry environment to the research environment all of these are you know quite different um, and I think you have to be able to adapt to the demands of each environment quite well um, to be able to kind of thrive and 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 do what you're supposed to do um, and then in terms of the actual I think for me personally, where the resilience really kicked in is when I went to the Fulbright Exchange at UCSD. And this was a time where the COVID pandemic was still rampant. And um, it was quite hard to get over there. There was border restrictions, you know, a lot of instability and kind of um, not really knowing what the future holds. Um, but I went over there and um, because of the border lockdowns, none of my friends or my family could come with me. So that was the first time in my life that I was kind of alone for the best sense of this world, of that word. I was alone. <laughs> um, and I think that during the, that, those nine months where I had to integrate again into a different community, into different society, into different research environment, new colleagues um, and everything like that, I think that's where it kind of really showed me that um, as a researcher, you do have to be adaptable to different environments and to different um, communities. Um, and then during my PhD work, then I went to another research exchange. I was very mobile <laughs> during my four years of my PhD when I went to um, the University of Minho and actually in Braga, which is quite close to Porto, I think, from your hometown. Um, so that was uh, another research exchange that I went to. So I think that adaptability to different research environments and, and societies, I think has like kind of, I've tried to um, continuously grow um, as I go, as I go along. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's very pretty there too. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. And yeah, um, I, I thought, you know, that probably this adaptability and resilience comes from moving around so uh, that's really mm -hmm. interesting to hear and congratulations that you did it and um yeah because i feel that many people say no or don't experience things out of like a uh, fear uh, yeah it is you know, quite challenging but... you know especially like you said like fear-based you know how is it gonna look yeah. you know everything like that <laughs> the unknown is quite scary <laughs> yeah exactly and we never know right how it would have been differently but um mm. yeah so congratulations to like how you um you know to your research um and Thank then you. also how you managed your life so and the stage is yours the slides everyone is on top uh pinned on top um alexandra says if you download them um, on in this uh, Google Drive format, some things overlap slightly. So if you download them, you will see them um, in a better format. And um, yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you, Alexander. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so to begin, um, my name is Alexandra Serafin, and I'm affiliated with the University of Limerick. And for the project that I'm going to propose to present on right now, um, my collaborators were also my supervisors, which, which are Professor Maris Collins and Dr. Mario Calabras Rubio. So um, just an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll first talk about the introduction to spinal cord injury. Um, it's pathology at a very, very, very top level. Um, so don't get scared by too much biology. I won't get into that. <laughs> then followed by the spinal cord injury treatment strategies and particularly the incorporation of electroconductive elements to biomaterial scaffolds. 
Um, followed by that, I'll briefly discuss the in vitro and in vivo work that we've done um, for this work and followed by some brief conclusions. So right now I'm going into the spinal cord anatomy and pathology. So if you were to click on slide four, that's what I'm going to begin. Um, so the main purpose of my, of my project is to treat spinal cord injury. Um, in terms of the incidences rates, about 12,000 new cases of spinal cord injury are reported in the U.S. alone, with motor accidents, falls, or violent acts attributed as the leading cause of these. Um, spinal cord injury affects mostly young adults, but there are some subsets of um, elderly patients who um, suffer from spinal cord injury as well. And you might think, well, why, why should we care about something that is so small in terms of the incidence rates? And the reason for this is that currently there is no effective treatment for spinal cord injury. And the healthcare alone for that um, injury amounts to about $10 billion per year in the U.S. alone. And this is due to the fact that depending on the area in which your spinal cord injury is um, happens, um, you can, per, for example, be paralyzed from the neck down if you sustain a spinal cord injury in your cervical area of your spine. So then we're talking about around the clock care, um, help with breathing. Basically, it's, it's quite challenging then. And that's why the, some of the healthcare costs are so high. Um, and as you can imagine, spinal cord injury also affects not only um, your day-to-day -day life, but also your mental health in a significant manner. Um, about 50% of people falling for spinal cord injury report severe mental health issues um, as a result of that. Um, in terms of the clinical, um, clinical aspects so that are currently available, the main focus right now is just on rehabilitation and prevention of further damage. So as it currently stands, there isn't a one true and tried tested way that we can we can treat spinal cord injury so that is why what, what this project focuses on so if you click onto slide number five um, you will then see the anatomy of the spinal cord so very briefly the spinal cord sits into the vertebral canal in the spine and it is composed of the dura matter the pia matter and the arachnoid matter um, the main purpose of your spinal cord is to con connect nerves in your body to your brain, basically acting as a message carrier via sense. So anything that you touch, that you see, smell, anything like that is transmitted from your, from your body to your brain where the brain processes this information and then sends out that information back again through your spinal cord to then have a particular um, reaction. And as you can imagine, disruption of this net nerve network can result in injury of the spinal cord. So moving on to slide number six, um, in terms of the spinal cord anatomy, um, there are two main components of the spinal cord, the gray and the white matter. The gray matter consists of neuronal cell bodies, axon terminals, glial cells, dendrites, as well as nerve synapses, while the white matter consists of myelinated axons, which surround the gray matter. Moving on to slide number seven, the composition of the spinal cord. So the extracellular matrix of the spinal cord is mostly composed of hyaluronic acid, collagen type four, fibronectin, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, proteins, axons, neurons. So all of these different um, spinal cells, as well as glial cells and astrocytes. So it's a very complex tissue. Um, then moving on to slide number eight, when we're talking about tissue engineering and engineering, biomedical engineering, a lot of the time we're trying to create biomimic environments of the host of the native tissue that we're trying to replicate. And a big part of that is you also have to look at the biomechanical aspects of such tissues. So for the purpose of this project, we initially started with a literature review on the biomechanics of the spinal cord. And unfortunately, there isn't that much data out there on the tests conducted for this, but generally, um, within within the field. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see the spinal cord Young's modulus of about one megapascal is often referred to as what we're, what we're trying to mimic. Then in terms of the actual spinal cord injury, in the injured spinal cord, astrocytes, so these are one of the primary cells of your spinal cord, become reactive and form a glial scar around the periphery of the lesion. So that is basically the main barrier to regeneration, the purpose, the, that glial scar. And then macrophages and microglia, which 
possess a similar role to macrophages innate to the CNS, become activated to clear up that debris and dead cells. So basically, if you see macrophages and microglia, they're basically signs of inflammation in the area and that an injury has occurred. And one of the key leading things in this uncontrolled inflammatory response, which happens after spinal cord, in cord injury, leads to even more neuronal and tissue damage. So unfortunately, as it stands, the spinal cord has very, very little ability to self-regenerate following an injury to the spinal cord. So that is kind of what we're trying to accomplish um, with tissue engineering. So moving on to slide number 10. So the aim of, overall aim of our project was to treat or to hope to treat, I should say, spinal cord injury by means of tissue engineering strategies. So tissue engineering scaffolds for spinal cord injury repair aim at bridging this neuronal gap to restore the sensory and motor functions to the patient. The focus on my project in particular was um, on scaffolds made from extracellular matrix components, which aim to replicate the natural environment of the spinal cord in a biomimicry manner. And for that reason, I focused on utilizing collagen derived gelatin and hyaluronic acid for scaffold development, as both collagen and hyaluronic acid are naturally present in the extracellular matrix of the spinal cord. So then we're moving into the incorporation of electroconductive nanoparticles. And you may ask, well, why would we want to do that in the first place? And the reason for that is that different studies have shown that incorporating electroconductive scaffolds into tissue engineering strategies for spinal cord injury actually promotes um, the proliferation and growth of um, spinal cells better than their non-conductive counterparts. So we wanted to investigate different ways that we can incorporate these electroconductive nanoparticles um, or elements. So initially we looked at carbon nanofibers or even different um, conductive polymers, but we kind of uh, steered away from that as you really have to have really high um, concentrations of, for example, of carbon nanofibers to reach a good percolation, at least in the systems that we have tested. And also you're kind of looking at their um, cytotoxicity can be quite high as well. So the reason for this, we decided to synthesize our own electroconductive P dot nanoparticles. In terms of um, P dot PSS, which is a commercially available conductive polymer, which is also readily used within the tissue engineering field, um, we wanted to move away from P dot PSS specifically because the PSS component has been found to be um, to not be very biocompatible when the tissue breaks down in vivo. So we wanted to get rid of that insulating PSS component, which the P dot in its current formulation requires to be um, soluble in water, and so that we wanted to create our own nanoparticles which did not have to have this PSS component. So how we went about this, so if you move to slide number 12, 12 um, we synthesize these nanoparticles by means of mini emulsion. So the continuous phase and the dispersed phase are mixed together by means of ultrasonication. And the surfactant used for that was PDA-DMAC and EDOT was the monomer. Um, and then these are mixed by means of ultrasonication, which forms small nano droplets, which are then stabilized by the surfactant. And then we added an oxidizing agent, which is iron 3 p telosulfonate hexahydrate, so FETOS for short, um, to start the reaction with the nano droplets then acting as nanoreactors. Um, so if you move to slide number 13, you will see um, the characterization of the peanut nanoparticles and the SEM on the left. We found that these nanoparticles have um, a diameter of about 187 nanometers and are quite stable with a nice round morphology. Um, in terms of the um, hydrodynamic size, they're about 330 nanometers then, um, just because of um, the water content. Then from the, uh, like I said, from the SEM analysis, these nanoparticles are round and stable. Um, and following also that the mini emulsion method can be further used to produce nanoparticles of a myriad of functionalizations in surface chemistry. For example, instead of the PDA DMAC as a surfactant, we can, for example, use HA as a surfactant. And then that changes how the nanoparticle can interact with, with cells or with different environments. And this work is continuously ongoing in our labs um, with Katrina Winters actually having published um, nanoparticles with HA as a surfactant as well. 
and we're currently in the process of publishing polyparallel nanoparticles, you, uh, which were made with a similar um, a similar method. So if you move on to slide number 14, you can see how we uh, develop these um, pedal nanoparticle scaffolds. So the process was quite easy. We just took gelatin, 10% weight per volume. Um, we added that um, the nanoparticle solution into that, followed by 1% hyaluronic acid. We then cast these into molds and slowly froze them to um, to have pores uh, created in these scaffolds, followed by lyophilization, and then we chemically crosslink them with EDC and NHS just to have that um, scaffold be crosslinked and not dissolve so fast in vivo. And then the material was then fully characterized by means of compression, conductivity, morphology, swelling, and in vitro and in vivo biocompatibility, to name a few. So if you move on to um, slide number 15, um, that's where the scaffold compression slide is on. So for that, we use a universal test compression test machine with a screw speed of about one millimeter per minute. And the Young's modulus was calculated as a slope in the linear region of a stress versus strain graph, so pretty standard stuff. Um, and the, why we did this, obviously, is to test the stiffness of the material or its ability to stress, stretch and compress. Um, so if you click through it, you can see that you have a, a strain and stress graph. This is just um, illustrative. And then you click on to actual the, the Young's modulus um, in megapascals of these scaffolds. So the Young's modulus for all of the samples remained in the desired range of one megapascal. So the addition of the nanoparticles um, didn't affect the Young's modulus to a very significant degree. And again, if I can reiterate back to the biomechanics of the spinal cord, it is around one megapascal that we're trying to mimic here. So we are very happy to see this result. Then if you move to the next slide, slide number 16, you can see the nanoparticle scaffold conductivity. And what we've seen is that with the addition of the nanoparticles, so the more nanoparticles you add, the more the conductivity increases. And particularly when you compare the P.1x sample to the gel HA control, you can see that a jump from about 2.3 by 10 to the minus 4 Siemens per centimeter for the control with no nanoparticles jumped to 8.3 by 10 to the minus 4 with um, the P.1x sample. So we did see a, an increase in the conductivity with the incorporation of these nanoparticles. If you move on to slide number 17, you have the SEM images um, of, the, of the scaffolds. So in, in A, the top row is just the surface of these scaffolds, and then B, C, B and C are the um, porosity inside of the scaffolds. And then D, you can see the nanoparticles actually embedded both within and on top of the structs of the pores. So we were quite happy to see that the nanoparticles were evenly dispersed throughout the scaffold with no aggregates observed, which is quite difficult to achieve in highly viscous systems such as these. And that the internal pore diameter was about 160 to 250 micrometers um, achieved throughout the scaffold with the specified manufacturing method of the slow free freezing and lyophilizing method. Um, if you move on to slide number 18, you can then see a swelling test conductor over a 96 hour period. So the addition of the nanoparticles didn't affect the swelling degree to a significant um, manner. And maybe just in case some people are from different backgrounds. So the reason why we're studying swelling uh, properties in tissue engineering, um, it's one of the most important parameters in hydrogel characterization as it informs on the volumetric changes the hydrogel scaffold will undergo by means of solvent absorption. So this is extremely important when you consider the potential negative impact of highly swelling scaffolds in vivo. So for example, if you have um, a lesion that you're trying to fill with a specific hydrogel and if when implanted in vivo and at the scaffold or the, the hydrogel swells to a very high degree, it can then impact um, the surrounding tissue by basically forcing the tissue or, or things like that. So we basically don't want the, the scaffold to swell to an extremely high degree. So we want that controlled swelling and degradation. 
So if you move on to number nine, slide number 19, you can see the FTIR. So FTR analysis allows for the identification and confirmation of the composition of the scaffold material by means of distinctive bands. So the FTR bands here show that all of the materials used for the scaffold production are still present after the manufacturing process. So the HA bands are depicted in blue lines, the gelatin bands are depicted in red lines, and the nanoparticle bands are visible in green. And if you want to have a full breakdown of all of those different bands, you can read our paper, but I'm not going to go through this as it's going to take way too long. Then following on to slide number 20, we also conducted rheological behavior and characterization of these materials um, to give us an overall idea about the viscoelastic flow behavior of these hydrogel systems. And uh, rheology can also especially inform on the ability of the hydrogels to be 3D printed. So these are some of the rheological test conditions that we've um, done for this. Um, a condition temperature of 37 degrees. We did a frequency sweep, steady state flows, and recovery tests as well. Um, so in terms of the storage and loss modulus, as the frequency is going up, you can have a, an increase in the storage and loss modulus. But due to the fact that the storage modulus was higher than the loss modulus, then the hydrogels are deemed to be within their elastic response. Then if you click on to slide 21, the first graph you can see with an increase in shear rate, the viscosity for all samples goes down. And you can see that the viscosity of the nanoparticle scaffold hydrogels is higher than the control with no nanoparticles. And then if you look at the recovery, um, so this basically informs that these, that these hydrogels have a shear thinning capability, which is what you want in a 3D printing scenario. And then if you look at the second graph, you can see that for the first 60 seconds, the stress on these hydrogels is very, very low, and that the first 60 seconds simulates the material being put inside the printing cartridge uh, for 3D printing, but no pressure is exerted on the material yet. Then within the next 10 seconds from 60 to 70 seconds, you have a very high increase in the shear rate, and that simulates the material being extruded through the, the nozzle, so basically being 3D printed. And then following that, you're particularly looking for um, from 70 to the next 60 seconds, you're looking at removing that high shear stress again, which again simulates the material being left alone after the printing process. So in particular, we're looking for that recovery following that high shear stress and how fast that recovery um, happens. So for example, if you have a very low recovery afterwards, then you can, for example, say that your material is going to um, kind of spread around and not maintain shape fidelity after it's being printed before you can introduce a cross-linking scenario, well, depending on which 3D printing um, method that you use. But overall, this just gives us an idea of how these materials can be 3D printed. Um, and what we've seen in these ones is that there is a very high recovery um, in a small period of time following this simulation of 3D printing and that when compared to the control, the addition of the nanoparticles increases this recovery as well. And we actually were able to successfully 3D print these materials as well. And I think they're in the supplementary data in the publication as well. So now I'm going to move on to the detailed in vitro and in vivo studies of this project. So for that reason, I traveled to the University of California, San Diego, um, to the neuroscience department. Um, so I was very happy when I had sun all year round because currently where I am in Ireland, it's mostly just rain all the time. So it was a very nice change of, of scenery. Um, then moving on to slide number 23. So um, in terms of the cytotoxicity, mesenchymal stem cells were first used um, to test the initial cytotoxicity of these materials. Um, so the MSCs were first seeded on conductive scaffolds, and then they were stained by different um, cellular tests, such as alum or blue, live dead markers, and then they were fixed and stained with DII and DAPI, and followed that, following on from that, we visualized these cells as well. In terms of the initial um, study with Alamer Blue, um, Alamer Blue basically allows 
um, to see how well your cells are proliferating. And so it's like an indirect test of cytotoxicity. Um, so if your cells are in a very highly stressful or toxic environment, they're not going to be happy and they're not going to proliferate or, or divide. So um, we take that more um, replication or, or more, more, the more the cells are dividing, basically, that they are in a, in a good, healthy environment. So um, when MSCs were tested with the scaffold, we seen that constant proliferation rates over a 96 hour period indicate that these scaffolds are probably not cytotoxic. Then if we move on to the next slide, you will see a lot of live and dead staining. So the first row uh, with the green um, cells is a live dead stain. Followed that from uh, below that, you can see a, a pinkish bluish um, image, which is the DII and DAPI. So DII basically just um, colors the cells and, D and DAPI colors the nucleus of the cells. So with the blue channel is just DAPI and the red channel is just the DII. So in terms of the live and dead staining for all of the scaffold samples, um, we saw a very high viability of the MSCs um, and all of them were above 86%. So even compared to the control the PDOT had a higher um, viability than the control by like 2%. Um, so from that, we can gather that the viability of these cells is very similar to the control with no nanoparticles, indicating that both the PDOT scaffolds do not pose cytotoxicity issues to MSCs. So if you move on to slide number 25, we, from the great results that we've gotten from the in vitro study we then wanted to move to the in vivo study to see how these materials actually behave when implanted in situ so for that reason we chose um, a rat model so male fisher rats underwent a full transactional spinal cord injury at the t3 level with the p.1x scaffold implanted into the lesion side and then four weeks post implementation the rats were sacrificed and the tissue of interest was excised so if you move on to the next slide, just if you are very queasy with blood, you might want to look away. But there are some images um, that we took during the actual implantation. So on the left, you can see the spinal cord um, surrounded by the dura matter. And you, you, the hole inside is that two millimeter gap where we excise the, the native spinal cord. And then on the right, you can see the, the PDOT material, the, the black thing um, being implanted into the spinal cord. And then for following the four weeks of implantation. At the bottom, you can see the spinal cord still with some of the vertebrae remaining, and then the spinal cord with the PDOT um, material implanted in the spinal cord next to the ruler as well. So then if you move on to the next slide, um, in terms of the immunohistochemistry, these tissues were then sectioned um, using a cryostat mounted on slides and were stained by means of immunohistochemistry and then visualized. So we chose four uh, primary stains. So those were axons, which were stained on NF200. Their reactive astrocytes were stained by GFAP. Microglia were stained with IBO1 and macrophages were stained with, stained with ED1, as well as we did also did nissel staining on these scaffolds as well. If you move on to slide number 28, um, you will see P.1x scaffold on the left when compared to the control, which was a lesion only control, so no implantation of any scaffold in, in to the right. Um, and NF200, uh, which is in green, stains axons, and GFAP stains reactive astrocytes uh, in red. So these reactive astrocytes are indicators of glial scar presence, which I mentioned at the start. So glial scar is the main barrier to regeneration of the spinal cord following injury. So on the left, you can see that the GFAP staining um, was not in direct contact with the scaffold. So uh, the lesion site and the scaffold is indicated by these white lines and um, the GFAP periphery is indicated by the white uh, arrows. Um, and then you can also see more axons going, in to going towards the lesion site at both the rostral and caudal sides of these of um, of these slides. Um, then moving on to uh, slide number 21, 29, 
We also have some quantification of uh, those two markers. So the GFAP marker is on the left and number of axons um, NF200 is on the right. So we observed that less GFAP reactivity in the scaffold group or, um, was observed than in the lesion, which means that there is less reactive astrocytes which could stimulate um, the formation of the glial scar. And as well on the right, you have a higher number of axons pass um, towards the lesion border, past the GFAP reactive periphery in the PDOT scaffold group when compared to lesion only control. Then in term, if you click onto slide number 30, um, you can see the IBO1 and ED1 staining. So IBO1 is in red, which stains microglia, and ED1 stains um, macrophages, and that is staining in green in these slides. So the activation of microglia um, or macrophages heavily influences also the reactive, um, the activation of astrocytes, so the GFAP uh, staining in the previous slides. And the presence of the microglia and macrophages follows a similar pattern to that of the GFAP in the slides, which makes sense. Also, the microglia and macrophages will always be present and are essential to regeneration, especially in such a traumatic injury as a full transection of the spinal cord. But again, I would like to reiterate that it's mostly that uncontrolled inflammation that has negative um, effects to towards um, neural regeneration. So we're kind of, it's a very fine line that you have to toe in not having um, a lot of inflammation, but having a lot, enough macrophages and microglia to actually clear up any um, debris that you have in your injury site. Then if you move on to slide number 31, we also quantified um, these. So again, we see a higher activation of microglia or macrophages. So IBA1 is on the left and ED1 uh, quantification is on the right. So again, we see a higher activation of microglia and macrophages present in the lesion only control when compared to the PDOT scaffold. And it appears that the inflammation around the lesion site is more controlled in the presence of the scaffold as a result. Um, then if you move on to slide number 32, in the left you have again the PDOT and on the right you have the control in terms of the nissel staining. Um, and again, lower reactivity and inflammation is reiterated in the nissel staining as well. Then moving on to slide number 33, just to conclude our study. So novel PDOT nanoparticles were successfully synthesized with a stable morphology and diameter of about 187 nanometers. The internal porous architecture of the gelatin HA hydrogel scaffold is maintained with the introduction of the novel nanoparticles with pores ranging from about 160 to 268 micrometers in diameter. The mechanical properties of all scaffold samples match that of native spinal cord around one megapascal. And the introduction of PETA nanoparticles increases the conductivity of the samples, especially when compared to the control. And the swelling degree was also not greatly affected by the addition of these nanoparticles over a 96 hour period. And the in vitro biocompatibility studies with MSCs showed great cellular uh, attachment over a 96 hour period with typical spindle-like morphology of MSCs observed. Live dead staining showed cell viability over 85% across all scaffolds, which indicate that these PETA nanoparticles um, should not be cytotoxic. Um, and then in vivo testing and SCI models showed great, greater axonal migration towards the lesion site in the scaffold group than in the injury model. And the GFAP upregulation was not directly in contact with the lesion site as well with diminished astrocyte reactivity observed. So diminished reactivity could also be attributed to the presence of high molecular weight HA in the material, which has been shown to limit astrocyte activation through the CD44 receptor, and thus lowering the number of immune cells such as microglia and macrophages, and also thus limiting glial scar formation in rat lesion models. So all of this can be attributed perhaps to the targeted scaffold immunomodulatory properties of HA. And um, this, all of this study, as I said before, has been published in Biomaterials Research. So if you want to have a more in-depth look at that, you can please check us out at that. And I just want to say I would like to thank the Irish Research Council and Johnson & Johnson under the Enterprise Partnership Scheme 2020 um, and the Fulbright Commission um, for providing funding for this research work.
and I'm open to any questions. So thank you for so much for listening to me um, and for allowing me to present my research work to you. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and this work is really um, so interesting. So um, I'll just go ahead with uh, some questions mm -hmm. and then also some people in the audience wrote me um, what I should ask. So um, <laughs> the, just to make clear for everyone, the MSCs that you implanted in, rat, in rats were human um, were human cell lines, right? So we didn't implant any stem cells into the actual rats. And so we only tested um, the in vitro cytotoxicity of these scaffolds with MSCs and they were rat derived. Okay, so so you didn't see um, what then? So, right, so um, when you're planning one day to um, implant this in humans, do you are you planning on using uh, MSCs from each individual human? Um, I'd like to make person a personalized construct, basically, or do you see the possibility in the future that you can have MSCs, um, you know, from a donor implanted in mm -hmm. different humans? Did did you think about that aspect uh, for the future? So I think that would be many, many, many years <laughs> down the line that if such a possibility came up. Um, in terms of the present work that we just wanted to see, because these materials were so novel, like, you know, we created these nanoparticles and we had no idea how they would interact with the body. So we initially wanted to take that step and to actually test and fully characterize these materials before we added any like stem cells or any additional um, therapeutic therapies into, into this um, project. But I think further down the line, um, because this, this was such an initial um, observation of how these materials behave, I think further down the line, there is the capability of perhaps um, adding um, specific stem cells into, into these scaffolds. Um, I think a, a big caveat in regards into implantation of stem cells is that you really have to look at um, how they're going to survive in situ before you can get a full vascularization to kind of connect with them. Um, so you're, it's very hard to keep MSCs alive in, in hydrogels over very long periods of time. So I think you would really have to include a lot of specific growth factors and, and, other, and other things like that for them to remain viable, um, to actually have any... Uh, additional therapeutic effect. Um, but I think if we are able to figure that out, then I think in an ideal world, yes, we will be using MSCs that are more patient derived and specific targeted therapeutics towards patients. But again, like I said, that is quite further down the line than what we what, what were initially trying to study. So right now we're just trying to um, focus more on the material because my, my lab is more material science based um, and biomedical engineering materials based. So, but that, that, is, that is a great question. Yeah, no, I, I was curious um, because you chose MSCs and there's like contradictive data out there um, of using, you know, one donor to transplant it into different patients. There yeah. are studies that say it works really well. And actually some people even add MSCs to other cell lines to make mm -hmm. them more compatible for yeah. implants. Um, so yeah, I was curious why you chose yeah. MSCs and if that maybe is already planning for the future. I think when you're actually trying to implant um, stem cells, you really have to look at um, trying to prevent that uh, that rejection that we also often see with with you know stem cells being implanted from one person to the other so I, I think it's quite hard to to achieve that at the present moment but again I'm my specialty isn't in stem cells <laughs> it's more in materials so um, if there's any stem cells um, experts here right now maybe they could chime in <laughs> well I, I contracted for a while for a stem cell company and um mm -hmm. yeah we 
we were starting to use MSCs exactly for that mm -hmm. reason, with the hope that um, because there are studies out there that kind of um, show that there's a low rejection rate okay. with, with MSCs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the question is, once the cells are really differentiated um, for a while, if that then is still the case. But there are already clinics out there that inject MSCs um, into, you know, knees and so on. Yes. Um, yeah. They really um, implant themselves or if it's just basically a scam, that's another. <laughs> that's yeah, I'm, I'm always reading those papers with a, with a grain of salt, you know, <laughs> to how well that works. But maybe it's just me being cynical. And if I'm offending anyone with that, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. So, uh, but it would be, no, why I'm asking that is, you know, I always think about... Um, I try to add up the cost more or less in my head for these implants and how many people will be able to afford yeah. these. Yeah. And if you could achieve or if somebody would achieve that, that you have basically from a donor um, mm -hmm. and you can grow these implants and, and buy them off the shelf, it would make mm -hmm. production costs way cheaper so yeah, more people sure. could afford this so like, it's more like affordability it wouldn't yes. be an issue right to take msc's out of fat tissue or out of anything yes. yeah and then grow it it's just more expensive than if you would have them off the shelf and exactly. also yeah. the materials you use for um you know the the gel basically are they um largely available is it is it something you know, or in the state you are at right now, or if you would need to scale it up basically for patients, for a large, larger population of patients, yeah. would you need to adjust anything? I think the way that they are constructed right now, like gelatin is a relatively cheap um, alternative to collagen. So in terms of that's where most of the bulk of the scaffold comes from is the gelatin, the 10% weight per volume gelatin. Um, an, ad, an additional cost will probably just be the, the HA, depending on your sources, that can be quite expensive or it could be not as expensive. So I think if you were to find a good supplier, like, for example, in the cosmetic industry, they have HAs and everything now, it seems all of your creams have HA in them. <laughs> so I think the more that we're trying to, to use HA, maybe that price will go down. Um, so I think in terms of the actual bulk of the material, it shouldn't be that expensive to produce. Um, and also the stability of these materials in terms of like their shelf life. So if you are uh, post lifeization, they can survive on the shelf for months and months, if not years, um, if you just don't introduce moisture to them. Um, so I think in terms of the stability um, and shelf life, they're, they're quite good. Um, in terms of the actual nanoparticles, um, we're currently only we're all the only people producing these nanoparticles <laughs> so in terms of scaling that up um, I think it is very easily it could be done very easily um, as long as you just control the, the the parameters within the synthesis I think it, it could be uh, possible but everything that we bought um, is bought through Sigma Aldrich and you know Thermo Fisher and so very readily available materials um, that anybody could purchase within the research um, or even um environments so i think they they for now i think they're quite easy to reproduce <laughs> oh, if you know what wonderful. you're doing <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's that's wonderful news and then victoria i'm asking in the back channel um um just in general um what's the most surprising finding from the research uh, you did and um what you know, what do you think are the biggest obstacles for the future to, to continue to develop this um, treatment, basically? Mm -hmm. The most surprising thing, I think personally for me, because I tend to be a bit of a pessimist with, in regards to my own research, I think I was most surprised that these rats survived. 
even the initial implantation of these materials and they actually did quite well so that to me in my pessimistic mind was the most surprising thing um, but I was told that maybe I should be more optimistic in regards to my research so maybe I should start to do that from now on and then in terms of the second question um, the what is the future of this I think particularly for my research I think it will be to um, have channels within these scaffolds so that the migration of axons is more enabled into the lesion site. Um, more maybe specific if you're looking at alternative therapies, maybe um, alternating these technologies so that they can be injectable. Because right now, the way that these scaffolds are created, you have to implant them specifically into a lesion site rather than with injectables with injectable um, hydrogels, maybe that filling up of the lesion precisely could be a bit easier. Um, that's another thing. But I think for me right now, it's mostly, mostly just maybe focusing on incorporating growth factors into these materials so that we can further enhance um, the regenerative effect that we're seeing in this tissue. Yeah, thank you. And did you think of when I, when I read your work, just the hydrogel part, did you think of using uh, this hydrogel or to offer this hydrogel for, um, you know, not for full spine lesions, but when people have, you know, um, the um, something, the bone basically, um, pressing on the nerve because in between you know you you have um when people get older the tissue in between becomes kind of weaker to support the spine i'm mm -hmm. trying to say it so that everyone the intervertebral discs you mean yeah yeah i'm trying yeah. <laughs> i always try to say things in a way that i use the least <laughs> words <laughs> like specific words was really hard but anyway, so the cushioning between the vertebra. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And yeah. do you think you could, out of this hydrogel, um, make a, a cushion, basically, that you could inject? That would be also be really helpful for a lot that of would people. Be, I mean, the way that these materials are designed at the moment, like they do resemble a sponge. So if you think about the gelatin structure and the porosity between that, it does have quite good like compressive capabilities. Um, so perhaps that's not something that I've ever thought about, to be honest, as an application. But I think as with most tissue engineering hydrogels or scaffolds, I think if you tune them in a specific way that you're looking for the target application, I think they can be applied to a variety of, of systems and therapeutic approaches. Um, but yeah, that's certainly an interesting um, idea that you just given me. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah. So, for example, can you... Can you make different varieties of um, how hard they are? Because then you could also yes. maybe inject it into the knee or the shoulder, wherever yes. you lose basically the flexibility and all the materials the body has to kind of exactly keep yeah. things flexible. That I would mean, be awesome. That would because the ones that are kind of provided right now by the industry are really not very flexible they usually have yeah. like like some metal around and then um mm. yeah some some cushion stuff in between but it's really not as flexible anymore and has a lot of issues so i think mm -hmm. the type of material could adjust really well to the individual shape of yes. of joints and and spines of different definitely. ones so, yeah yeah definitely. <laughs> i think even um from um, an engineering perspective like having different concentrations of the gelatin um, really does influence the mechanical properties um, of these materials so you can have less gelatin and then that will the material will be less stiff for example to I'm not really sure about the the intervertebral disc what are the biomechanics of that tissue but I think if you if it's quite easy to tailor it to whatever you want really increasing gelatin concentration decreasing gelatin concentration perhaps increasing the cross-linking efficiency. All of these are like very easy things to change that can readily impact how your material behaves, um, as you said, for specific um, applications. Yeah. Yeah, and then you mentioned the part 
Yeah, I think that would be amazing and probably the most, you know, straightforward application while yeah. you do all the research with stem cells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which then, is quite hard because I've worked yes. with neur neuronal stem cells as well and sometimes you look at them wrong and they all die so I know <laughs> yeah that's why I thought maybe MSCs and then differentiate them in the body mm -hmm. you know you implant MSCs with some specific growth factors and and yeah. um, factors to make them define into the right neurons and then mm -hmm you you implant and try to let them do it in the organism and hopefully yeah. the organism helps yeah. <laughs> definitely and, and then and then the other question would be um if you i don't know the, does the military any military come to you and ask <laughs> for your help because it not yet, no. like <laughs> It would be very useful right now. Also. Well, actually, particularly most of the... So when I was at UCSD, most of their affiliations were with the Veterans Hospital in, in San Diego, where, we, you know, a lot of um, people who come back from, from combat and, and war, like, they do have a lot of blast injuries from bombs to, in their spinal cord. So that is something that... Um, that the military is investing heavily in at the moment. Um I'm not sure how it is in, in other house hospitals or even within Europe, but I just know that that is what's something that they're investigating in the Veterans Hospital, hospital in UCSD. But no one has oh. contacted me yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am open. My LinkedIn is open. <laughs> well, you know, because I feel like that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, for, for the future. And then Willie mm -hmm. talked about something... You know, we had the previous guest speaker, um, Michael Levin. I don't know if you know him. He maybe you read in the news about this self-replicating xenobots. Um, you know, he can okay. he basically makes kind of organism tiny robots and can program that. Like Whoa, okay. he gives him he gives them incentive to then oh. fulfill specific tasks, those cells. Uh, okay. So there, in that case, they um, got them to self-replicate pretty efficiently. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, but he works on different projects. What he basically says and what his work also really interestingly shows is if you give the right incentives, cells will figure out what they need to do in that case so the holy grail basically is for him to find a way um that okay. you don't have to give a full set of instruction with dna code and everything mm -hmm. uh, to for example to heal you know neurons in the spine you mm -hmm. give basically a broader instruction and then the cells will figure out what they need to do. So uh, um, this is basically the principle. It's it's really interesting work. It would take okay. too long for me to explain. I will everything. definitely check that out. Yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> and, and maybe reach out to him or we can connect because I think Perfect. working with him, with your, um, you know, engineering, um, hydrogel and gel mm -hmm. engineering combined with his, combined with his, you know, cells mm -hmm. that you know get these instructions to repair stuff or to do different tasks I think yeah. it would be the ideal combination so yeah definitely yeah combination approaches um yeah maybe we'll be able to figure it out finally <laughs> yeah, yeah but exactly. like we're we're always open to collaborations and to different um, projects and ideas so if anyone uh, even listening right now wants to reach out to us for collaborations, please do. We're, we're so, we will be so happy to do that. Yeah, I think that would be really wonderful. And thank you, Willie, for mentioning that. Um, and he will be back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, we are supposed to meet, like to talk about beginning of March, so next week, and then to talk about mm -hmm. when he will be giving oh, another perfect. talk here again so yeah i'll keep my eyes open for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so 
we've been talking around an hour so i wanted to give you the opportunity to go back to your life (laughs) (laughs) well no this has been this has been fantastic and you know like as researchers we sometimes don't get that many opportunities to have these kind of nice discussions maybe apart from conference once or twice a year so um, I'm really thankful that you that you reached out to us and, and allowed us to um, present our work with, with your lovely audience. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for taking the time and come back anytime, as I said, and let's keep in touch. Maybe, you know, we'll reach out to Mike. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we wish you all the best. We will um, follow mm-hmm. your work because I think, you know, all these all, you know, the project you're working on will have, of course, a lot of applications for people to c- get mm-hmm. back to their regular life. So that's wonderful. And thank you for doing that work. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And thanks, everyone, for coming, for sending me questions. Um, this always makes the discussion more interesting. And um, if you like discussions like this, um, we'll have... Um, next week, Dr. Sigmundson talking about um, his research, um, how to teach children really effectively reading. I don't know if you know, but especially in the US, um, reading capability in young children is not necessarily the best because there has been like kind of misinformation and really bad science leading um, the educational program um, that has been debunked for a while, but um, a lot of school districts still use a really weird method. They just give them books and let them sit there and they say they will figure it out and then kids don't and then their future is kind of ruined. So um, Dr. Sigmundson does work um, in that. um, uh, systematically and he will present it um, next week here and then we'll have Dr. Lenzi also coming and talking about a lightweight uh, robotic leg prosthesis so um, this will be also I think kind of interesting so thank you Alexandra thank you everyone for coming uh, it was a wonderful and happy weekend everyone <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Happy weekend, everyone. Okay, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone.